The explorers of Australia did it for many motives. Some were hungry for land. Some were hungry for fame. Some regarded themselves as men of destiny. And some were driven by a sense of duty or a thirst for knowledge. In the race to cross Australia from the south coast to the north coast in 1860, the major motive was something else, direct intercolonial rivalry. Both Victoria and South Australia wanted the glory of launching the first expedition to travel the continent from sea to sea. Their heroes, Stuart from South Australia and Birkin Wills from Victoria, found themselves locked in a race to the finish. Crossing the continent from south to north was no easy task. Gallant men had already been beaten back from the centre of Australia. Eyre, in 1840, was blocked by what he thought was an impassable horseshoe lake north of the Flinders Ranges. Another expedition set out from Adelaide four years later, led by Captain Sturt. Sturt set out to explore the centre of Australia, but wherever he went, he was forced to retreat. To the west were salt pans. To the north, endless desert. But he did find one place of permanent water. He called it Cooper's Creek. Twelve years after Sturt's heartbreaking expedition, the skilled explorer Augustus Gregory exploded one of the great myths of the interior. Gregory found that there was no horseshoe lake only a chain of separate salt pans with possible tracks between them. John McDowell Stewart, a tough little Scots-born surveyor, soon followed up this discovery. Stewart had been with Captain Sturt on the desert expedition. He learned something from it, and his own expeditions had no cumbersome drays and slow herds. He relied only on horses, and he kept moving. Stuart threaded a way up past Marie, through the gap between Lake Torrens and Lake Eyre, opening the way to the north. When the South Australian government offered a cash prize of 2,000 pounds to the first expedition to break through to the northern coast of Australia, Stuart confidently pushed out with only two companions, William Keckwick and Ben Head. In 1860, he reached what's now the Northern Territory and named the great monolith Chambers Pillar for one of the pastoralists who financed his expeditions. He named the Fink River for his other patron. He named the Macdonald Ranges for the governor of South Australia. 200 kilometres north of Alice Springs, Stuart found the centre of Australia, which so many had speculated and dreamed about, and found it was neither a desert nor an inland sea, but a lightly grassed plain. It had been the heart's desire of Captain Sturt to find this spot, and Stuart honoured his old commander by naming the nearest mountain, Central Mount Sturt. Three cheers for Captain Sturt the father of Australian exploration. Hip hip, hooray! Hip hip, hooray! Hip hip, hooray! And one more for Mrs. Sturt and family. Hooray! hooray! Let this be a sign to the natives that the dawn of liberty, civilization, and Christianity is about to break upon them. Captain Sturt was deprived of the honor intended for him. The mountain went down on the map as Central Mount Stuart. Stuart's notion of the blessings he was bringing to the natives was another mistake, 
although it was a typical 19th century explorer's statement. The natives preferred their own version of liberty, civilization, and religion. At a place called Attack Creek, the Aborigines fired the grass and rained boomerangs on Stuart's party. Stuart made a decision. I have most reluctantly come to the determination to abandon the attempt to meet the Gulf of Carpentaria. I think it would be madness and folly to attempt more. If my own life was the only sacrifice, I would willingly risk it to attempt my purpose. But it seems that I'm destined to be disappointed. Man proposes, but the Almighty disposes, and his will must be obeyed. It was the end of June, 1860. Stuart did not reach Adelaide with his news till October. He had solved one of the great mysteries of the world, the nature of the centre of Australia. It was ranked with the discovery of the source of the Nile. And this remarkable achievement, with just two companions, won him the gold medal of the Royal Geographical Society in London. Meanwhile, great things were happening in Melbourne. Inspired by the confidence of gold, Victoria was determined to do what it had never done before, to launch an exploring expedition to cross Australia from south to north. This expedition established several firsts. It was the first Victorian expedition, the first to make major use of camels, specially imported from India, and the first to have such lavish backing over 9,000 pounds from the Victorian government and the Exploration Committee. And it was the first to have a leader whose total exploring experience was nil. Robert O'Hara Burke was an Irish police superintendent on the goldfields. Why he volunteered as leader and why the Exploration Committee chose him remains a mystery. The surveyor appointed to chart the expedition's track was William Wills. An earnest young man from Devon, who was to become Burke's right-hand man. The departure of the Burke and Wills expedition from the Royal Park, Melbourne, was the greatest spectacle, or as some put it, the greatest circus ever seen in that city. 18 men, 23 horses, 27 camels, and wagons with 21 tonnes of stores and equipment to last a year, slowly moved out of the city and across Victoria. The best of everything, from rockets and colt revolvers, to brandy, preserved fruit and vegetables, even firewood. Stuart was already out in the centre with his horses, and Burke was going up to race him with his camels. Melbourne Punch made the most of this intercolonial challenge. A race, a race, so great a one, the world ne'er saw before. A race, a race across this land, from south to northern shore. The horseman hails from Adelaide, the camel rider ours. Now let the steed maintain his speed against the camel's powers. Burke's plan was to strike north from the known permanent water of the Darling at Menindi to the known permanent water at Cooper's Creek, and then directly to the known rivers of the Gulf. Burke was keen to win the race and impatient at any delay. Wills tried to restrain Burke, but he also knew that Victoria expected them to win the race. When there were problems organizing supplies at Menindi, Burke and Wills decided to dash ahead with an advance party. Here at Cooper's Creek, Burke spent five frustrating weeks waiting for the rest of his men and stores to arrive. But bureaucratic bungling by the Exploration Committee delayed their departure from Menindi. Burke could wait no longer. His patience snapped on the 16th of December. And leaving four men at Cooper's Creek, 
He set out with Wills, John King, Charlie Gray, and three months' supplies. In that time, he hoped to walk to the Gulf and return to Cooper's Creek. Meanwhile, in South Australia, the Stewart challenge was on again. Mr. Kickwick! Don't slacken your pace, man! Keep moving! Right, men. Come on. The Parliament had voted Stuart two and a half thousand pounds to lead a large and well-equipped party to the north and beat Burke and Wills. By the middle of February, 1861, Stuart was back on the track he knew so well and had reached the Fink River. But, unknown to him, the race was already won. Burke and Wills had followed an almost direct line through western Queensland, walking 12 hours a day in dry country, until they struck tidal flats near the Gulf of Carpentaria. It had taken Burke and Wills two months to walk the thousand kilometres to the Gulf. The mangrove swamps on the Flinders River prevented them from seeing the open waters of the Gulf. But they had made the first crossing from sea to sea. Burke's party was in desperate need of a rest, but time and the weather were against them. Burke had only one month's time and one month's supplies to make the return trip to Cooper's Creek. So they turned round and began a night and day forced march. It was a desperate journey and it cost them four of the camels and Burke's horse, Billy. Right ahead between the trees near the creek. Then Charlie Gray fell sick and died on April the 17th. Four days later, they staggered back into their camp at Cooper's Creek, but they were too late. The men who'd been stationed here had waited an extra month, but they gave up and left just seven hours before Burke returned. If Burke had not stopped to bury Gray's body, he'd have met the depot party. At first, Burke and Wills could not believe that they'd been deserted. Pardon? McDonough? 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 They must have moved camp further up the creek. I don't think so, Mr. Burke. Look. The note from the leader of the depot party, Bray, said that nobody had come up from the Darling with supplies, and they were leaving that day to follow their southeast track back to Menindi. Burke, Wills and King were utterly devastated. They were too exhausted to follow Bray's party. In fact, they couldn't walk another step. Bray, for his part, had waited an extra month, but with his supplies running out and his men sick from scurvy, he felt he could wait no longer. Burke had been instructed to keep his party together at all times, but he insisted on racing for the north coast before he got all his men and all his supplies here to the depot at Cooper's Creek. With all the bungling at Menindee and in Melbourne, those extra supplies never reached Cooper's Creek, and that was the major cause of the tragedy. Robert O'Hara Burke had won the great race, but he was never to know it. And the message in the bottle, here at the dig tree, was the last message he ever had.
On the day Burke and Wills returned to Cooper's Creek, April the 21st, 1861, John McDowell Stewart reached Tennant Creek, far to the northwest. Three days later, he passed Attack Creek, where he'd had to abandon his last expedition. In late May, he reached Newcastle waters. From here, he tried for two months to reach the north coast, but was beaten back 11 times by dense scrub and lack of water. Stewart's last gesture before returning to Adelaide was to name a creek for a rival he called Richard O'Hara Burke. That brother explorer, Robert O'Hara Burke, would never know of this generous gesture. Burke had persuaded Wilson King to leave the Cooper's Creek Depot and to travel with him southwest down the creek, instead of southeast towards Menindee and the support party. Fifteen days after Burke and Wills had left the depot, Bray and another man, Wright, returned, just in case someone had turned up. But they noticed nothing. The ground by the dig tree looked undisturbed, and they didn't check to see if the stores were gone. The two men spent only 15 minutes at the camp. A closer look would have revealed traces of Burke and Wills some spilt nails, a billy, a broken bottle. Burke, Wills and King were at this moment only 50 kilometres away, down the creek. They had been beaten back by sand hills, and they now realised, too late, that their only hope was a rescue party. Three weeks after Bray's visit, Wills struggled back up the creek to this tree, the dig tree. But he could see no sign of their visit. And when he dug near the tree, he found Burke's message still waiting there. All of them had kept disguising the things buried in the ground and raking earth over them because they didn't want the Aborigines to dig them up. But incredibly, none of the explorers, not Burke and Wills on their first return to Cooper's Creek, not Bray and Wright on their return, and not Wills now, on his second return, ever thought to blaze any other message on the dig tree. But Wills did leave one bitter last note buried in a bottle in the ground. Depot camp, May 30th. Both camels are dead and our provisions are done. We are trying to live the best way we can, like the blacks, but find it hard work. My pulse is at 48 and very weak. And my legs and arms are nearly skin and bone. Six weeks after their return to Cooper's Creek, Burke and Wills were both dead. King alone survived, through the nobility of a now vanished tribe who took him into their camp and treated him with more humanity than most explorers could ever muster for Aborigines. A rescue party, led by a skilled bushman, Alfred Howart, arrived at last from Melbourne. But there was nothing they could do for Burke and Wills, except bury them. It was September the 21st, 1861. By the time Stewart launched his third attempt to cross the continent, he knew of the melancholy fate of Burke and Wills. Men are ready, Mr. Stewart. He also knew that they had reached the north coast before him. But Stewart had explored so efficiently and discovered so much on his first two expeditions across the centre that the South Australian government backed him for another try. We'll maintain this northerly battery, Mr. Keckwick. Mount up! In January 1862, he left Finnis Springs, near Lake Eyre, with a strong party. The men were mostly young South Australians. They carried no heavy surveying equipment. 
Everything was designed for speed and mobility. They had carbines, and every man had a pistol in his belt. This time, they meant to get through. Stewart had already blazed most of the track that was to be followed by an overland telegraph line. And he was back at Newcastle Waters by April 1862. Here he was repelled again by dense waterless mulga forests. Stewart abandoned his attempt to reach the Victoria River and took a more northeasterly course. And in late May, he broke through to Daly Waters. Now he came under fierce attack, with the Aborigines burning the bush all around him. Open fire! Stuart had always enforced strict organization and iron discipline on his men. Every man had written orders to obey the leader. Nobody was to fire on the natives without orders, unless in self-defense. Cease fire! Mr. Keckwick. All clear, Mr. Stewart. They've gone. All right, men. Move out. Every man must keep his guns handy. And if the night watch ever fell asleep, Stewart personally promised to shoot him dead. Stewart particularly impressed on his men the need to care for the horses because they were the key to everyone's survival. But the horses were already weak, and even Stuart was starting to fade. I feel this heavy work, much more than I did the journey of last year. So much of it is beginning to tell on me. I feel my capability of endurance beginning to give way. They were nearly there. Stuart found a creek which led him north to the Roper River at the end of June, 1862. It is a splendid river. We have passed many brooks and deep reaches of water, some miles in length, and the country could not be better. It is really magnificent. The water of this river is most excellent. The soil is also the first description, and the grass, although dry, most abundant from two to five feet high. This is certainly the finest country I have seen in Australia. After crossing a rough and stony tableland, Stuart came to a beautiful river running northwards through a deep gorge. He named it the Mary, and he followed it through swamp country to Chambers Bay. 80 kilometers east of Port Darwin. At last, on the 25th of July, 1862, Stuart was able to dip his feet and wash his hands and face in the Timor Sea. He was overwhelmed by his success. I have, through the instrumentality of divine providence, been led to accomplish the great object of the expedition and take the whole party safely through one of the finest countries men could wish to behold. If this country is settled, it will be one of the finest colonies under the crown, suitable for the growth of any and everything. Stuart's joy was short-lived. On the 3,000 kilometer journey back to Adelaide, the horses became so weak that every item of surplus equipment had to be thrown out, even the men's boots. No rain had fallen, and the land was dangerously dry. Unable to ride, Stuart was carried along on a stretcher, slung between two horses. By the time they reached the McDonnell Ranges, Stuart was in agony from advanced scurvy. His limbs had turned black, and his gums were so sore and swollen that he couldn't chew any food. 
Stewart believed that he was in the grip of death. My body is reduced to that of a living skeleton, and my strength is that of infantine weakness, a sad wreck of former days. But there is no danger of the party not being able to find their way back should I be taken away. They did find their way back, all of them, and they recovered their health. On the 21st of January, 1863, Stuart and his gallant band of men, dressed in their ragged bush clothes and trailed by 40 bony pack horses, rode in triumph along King William Street, Adelaide. John McDowell Stuart was the hero of the hour. With indomitable courage, he had persisted till he found a practical track across the continent, and he had returned safe with all his men. On the very same day that cheering crowds welcomed Stuart back to Adelaide, one third of Melbourne's population watched in silence the state funeral of Burke and Wills. Their bones had been brought back by Alfred Howard from Cooper's Creek. There were those who wondered why Howart and others who went out like him with fairly modest parties in search of Burke and Wills, explorers like McKinley, Landsborough and Walker, could traverse vast areas of unknown country, make valuable discoveries on their own account and yet return safely, while the Burke and Wills expedition had cost a fortune, turned out a disaster and was commemorated in massive statues. Why had it all gone so terribly wrong? A royal commission into the tragedy put most of the blame on the inertia of Wright, the man who failed to bring up the supplies from Menindee, and on the exploration committee in Melbourne. Burke, they said, showed more zeal than prudence. Little was said about the original public attitudes to the transcontinental crossing, as not a matter of life and death, but a Melbourne Cup, with the local money on the unfortunate O'Hara Burke. In the end, Stuart's monuments were not great epitaphs in stone or bronze, but massive changes to the map of Australia. No explorer did more for his colony. South Australia gained the Northern Territory because of Stuart. Eventually, the railway and the Stuart Highway followed his tracks across Australia. But his most significant achievement was blazing a trail for the Overland Telegraph Line, which was built between Adelaide and Darwin in 1871. That established a series of cable stations and bases for explorers to attack the last great blank on the map, the country west of centre, from the Telegraph Line to the Indian Ocean. The challenge of this country produced the last great epics of Australian exploration. By John McDowell Stewart in 1862. Within 10 years of Stewart's crossing, the march of